So we're going to do this, and uh, this will be part of uh, really a new training that we're doing on fixing credit report errors. And, and like I have up here on the screen, you know, really the options are when you find actual errors on your credit reports and you properly dispute those, there's only three options. For each account that has errors, it can be fixed, fixed of all errors. It can be deleted, or you can look at suing. Okay, and so that's what sort of the big picture is. And today, even though this will be a little bit sort of out of order, I think it'll make sense. And then my plan is, I'm still trying to figure this out. It may be that we're going to knock out two kind of longer sessions on Monday and Tuesday, or it'll be on Thursday and Friday. I'm still adjusting my schedule, but you'll get a notification uh, from the software. Okay, so, and let's see, Kenneth said no sound for me. Um, I think everybody else is hearing that. You might just need to refresh your screen and hopefully that will work, Kenneth. Uh, so uh, look, here's the big picture of the steps. And I, I've got these listed. You know, we start off with pull our real credit reports and then we want to analyze those and then prepare a detailed dispute letter, not some generic or some vague dispute letter, but very detailed dispute letter. We send that by certified mail. And all of these we'll cover, and I'm trying to compress all the trainings into two little bit longer sessions. Again, those will either be Monday and Tuesday or Thursday and Friday of next week. And so we'll go over the, this is just the big picture. And then we get those results back. And let's assume not everything's fixed, not everything's deleted. Well, then what do you do? Well, this is a step that we have added recently, and that is to call. But before we call, we want to pull our new credit report. So from a timing standpoint, you know, we had a set of credit reports that we created the dispute letters from. Then we get results of investigation back from the credit bureaus, pull new credit reports, and sometimes there's discrepancies between the results of investigation and new credit reports that are dated, you know, within a day or two of each other. So we look at all that. Then we call each credit bureau. And that's really what the focus of this webinar is on, calling each credit bureau. And then we'll get new results of investigation back because we'll tell them over the phone to do a dispute. And then we pull new credit reports. Okay, so a lot of credit reports, but we're pulling these. And again, we compare results of investigation. That would be the second results of investigation with new credit reports. It's amazing the number of times there's differences. And then we look at suing. Okay, so that's kind of the big picture here. And so let me explain why, again, we're going out of order. It would make sense if we started with number one, pull your real credit reports, and we certainly will cover that. But I want to do it this way, and I think of Stephen Covey that sort of popularized the expression of start with the end in mind. Okay, so if you imagine the lawsuit, that's really going to be a lawyer doing that. So the, the final piece that you play a vital role in is the phone call, Okay. So now we start thinking about, okay, if I'm having a phone call, what's that like? Well, that's like sitting across the table from Mr. Equifax or Miss Experian or Mr. TransUnion or Innovis or Clarity. Those are typically the five bureaus we deal with. And imagine that they go, okay, I understand you have a problem or you have some questions. Well, you wouldn't want to go in there unprepared and be like, well, yeah, it seemed like you guys did something wrong. I mean, you don't want that. You want to be very prepared. So being very prepared as we think about that, it says, all right, now we got to back this thing up and say, well, then I need a really good dispute. Okay. And I need to understand exactly what's on my credit reports. I don't want to use credit karma. And I'm sitting there talking to Mr. TransUnion and I say, well, look what you have on here. And he looks over and goes, uh, that's credit karma. That's not our data. Oh, okay. So let's have our real reports. Let's have our letters. Let's have the results of investigation. It just helps us to understand We've got to be super prepared for this, okay? And then we want to, if the more we think about, you know, having that phone call or in my sort of imagination, we're sitting across the table from the credit bureau. Then I think if you have that in your mind as you go through the training sessions next week, and again, whether you meet, you know, uh, meet with us live or you get the recordings, you know, either way would be fine. I think it'll make more sense. Again, start with the end in mind. So what's the purpose of the call? Well, there's really three points we want to get out of it. And we'll go over these in more detail. But 
what happened? They said they did an investigation. What happened? You want them to talk. I want to do another dispute or investigation on each of the accounts that weren't fixed or deleted. And then I want my full complete file disclosure. Okay. So those are the objectives. We'll come back to these in a minute. So what do we need before we make the call? And, you know, there's other things we could add to this, but hopefully this is sort of a common sense list here where we go, well, I need my dispute letter, right? Because I'm, I'm calling them about this dispute letter that I sent that they didn't properly investigate. So it makes sense. I'd want to have my dispute letter and, you know, maybe not have the phone call on my phone and the PDF of the dispute letter on my phone and the results of investigation on my phone. If possible, it'd be nice to have those things printed out. And so I can make notes on them. I can, you know, like maybe out of five accounts, account number four, they actually deleted. Okay, well, you know, to draw an X on that part of my dispute letter. And the rest of it, you know, I can mark it up if they're talking about the account. So if I'm on the phone with them and they say, well, you know, on your Citibank account, here's why we didn't do X, Y, and Z. Well, you can make notes of that. We'll also talk about recording the calls, okay? And I think I saw that there's a uh, question from Colt about recording the calls, and we'll talk about that. But you just want to have your materials out, okay? So your dispute letter, the results of investigation, uh, that's going to have a phone number on. It's going to have a reference number, a file number, an account number, something on there. Then so when you call in, it helps to have that number. Your new credit reports, because what if you say, for example, you dispute Capital One because you paid it off in June of, let's say, 2020, and you owe zero in June. You paid it off. But in July, they report that you have a balance. And in August, they report you're still a charge off in the month of August. And so you dispute that. Results come back and it only shows them reporting through May. Remember, you paid it off in June, and but the results come back, it only shows May. But then you pull your real credit reports from annualcreditreport.com and that same credit bureau shows you you know, charge off in May, charge off in June, charge off in August. You're like, well, wait a minute. That's kind of weird, right? Why does the results of investigation say one thing, credit reports say another? You want to have all that in front of you, okay? And then you want to know the phone number, okay? The phone number is going to be on the results of investigation, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time. And so let's say, if you have any questions, call this number. Yeah, actually, I do have some questions. So you want that. A way to record the call. If you're recording it, we'll talk about how to do that. And uh, certainly a way to take notes, okay? So, you know, you've got a, a pen, right? A Sharpie, something. You know, you've got these, these materials printed out or, you, you know, even if you have all those, you've got a notebook to make notes, like whatever you need to make notes. Again, I would not try and do all of this just on my phone, okay? So obviously your phone's going to be involved because you're making a phone call. But to the extent you can have it printed out or have a tablet with some of this on there where you can make notes on it. You just want to make it as easy as possible. You sort of imagine this, like you're having that face-to-face -face conversation with Mr. Equifax or, you know, Mr. Angenia and, and they say something you're like, Oh wait, wait, you know, my, my phone's jammed up here. Uh, give, give me like five minutes, to try to pull that file back up. Well, it's better just to like have it right there. Okay. So let's talk about recording the call and, you know, this whole thing, make it very clear. You guys know this, you know, it's not legal advice. I'm not your lawyer. Unless I happen to represent you, then I'll be your lawyer, but we won't be communicating by this. This is just for general educational purposes. So you have to make your own decisions on recording. Okay. So let, let me give you kind of the big picture and then we'll start to narrow it down. The big picture is some states are one party states and some are two. What does that mean? Well, one party state, as long as one party on the call consents to it being recorded, you can record it. So for example, Alabama is a one party state. So if I'm in Alabama and Bob is in Alabama and we call each other, well, as long as one of us consents to it, that person can record the call. Okay. But a state like Florida is a two party state. So both parties need to agree. And so sort of the conventional wisdom has been, well, if you're in Alabama, that's one party state. doesn't matter where you're calling, where the call came from. 
And that's really true for the most part under Alabama law, but what about the law of Florida or some other state that's a two-party state? They may take the view that you're subject to their law. So you can either not record or you can say, you know, when they say the call can be recorded, you may say, that's great. I'm recording it also. Now, a lot of times they freak out if you're recording the call. Okay. Well, why would they do that? They're recording it. Why would they not want you to record it? Because here's why they record it. And then if there's a lawsuit, if the call is great for you, I mean, you know, the, the Equifax person says, yeah, we don't do any investigation. We just send it to the, the furnisher, the data furnisher. They tell us what to do. We don't do anything with it other than that. Well, that's fabulous for a lawsuit. Well, if that's the case, that call, now they would say I'm very skeptical and cynical and all that, but just follow my hallucination here. That call will be accidentally deleted in a computer glitch. Like, oh yeah, we, we had that call and something happened. It got deleted. So sorry about that. Okay. Now, if it's helpful to them, there is no computer glitch. They have that call. Okay. So they don't want you to have a recording of it. So if you tell them you're recording, they may say, well, I refuse to talk to you. Okay. So I'll just tell you what we do. You have to make your own decision. Okay. It, particularly, you know, whatever state you're in, you've got to figure out the laws of your state, talk to a lawyer in your state, all that sort of stuff. I'll just tell you what my view is. If I call and let's say I'm calling my mortgage company and they say, please be advised, all calls may be recorded or monitored for quality control purposes. I look at that and say, well, they said the call may be recorded. Sounds like they're giving me permission, right? They're saying, hey, we just want you to know this may be recorded. Now, if you think about it, if I don't say anything, can they record that call? Well, yeah, because if I keep talking to them, I've agreed to it. If I've agreed and they've agreed, because obviously they have, they said it may be recorded. One plus one is two. Okay. So I just take this and say, you know what, if I'm calling a mortgage company and they say all calls may be recorded, I go, fine. They're saying I can record the call. Kind of hard for them to complain about it later on when they recorded the call, but they're like, but we didn't want you to record it. Okay. And it's like I had a case one time where a voicemail recording was the central piece of evidence. And this just show you the absurdity of these people. The lawyer on the other side said, John, that was an illegal recording. I'm like, um, your client waited while it said, hey, you've reached, you know, Bob Smith, please leave a message at the beep, beep. And he, rec he, he left a message. I'm like, he knew he was being recorded. And the Lord's like, well, I think it's still illegal. Like, really, you think every voicemail is illegal? You know, try that on the judge. And of course he backed down. But I just say that to say sort of the absurdity of what they're doing. So you have to make your own decision what you do. If you don't record, take really good notes. If you can record, test it out first. Okay. Don't assume that you know how to record a call. Don't assume all your equipment's working. Test it first. Okay. I, I can just tell you, I have so many people that are like, John, this is a fabulous recording. Uh, absolutely amazing. And they send it to me and it's only their side of the conversation or it's just completely silent. Nothing on it. I'm like, did you test it? No, no, I didn't have two minutes to test it. I'm like, well, you did a 23 minute phone call that's of no value. So test it. So I have up here, there's a simple way to do it. And then there's an app for it. Here's the simple way. Call on your cell phone, put on speakerphone, and then on your laptop, your tablet, another cell phone, just do the voice recorder. Okay. So uh, I think on a Windows, I'm trying to remember exactly what it's called. I think it's like voice recorder, sound recorder, something like that. You know, on my iPhone, it is, um, let's see, I think it's under voice memos. That'd be the same of iPad. I don't know what Android did. There's going to be some built-in voice sound recorder, okay? And, you know, all you have to do is whatever type of tablet you have, computer you have, uh, phone you have, just Google it, right? How do I record voice or sound on this? Now, you know, sometimes people say, well, I want to call from my cell phone and hit the voice memo on my cell phone. Well, that doesn't work. Okay. But what we're talking about is if this is playing on speakerphone, then your laptop's just going to record it or your tablet or your spouse's cell phone where you do the voice memo. Again, test it out, call somebody, 
Don't just say, well, you know, I know six months ago it worked. Call somebody right before you make the call to Innovus or Clarity, Experian, Equifax, TransUnion, and say, hey, I'm just testing this out. You know, can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. You record it, stop, hang up, press play, make sure it works, all right? This sort of more complicated way, in a sense, and it may cost some money, is you get an app. So you go on the Google Play Store or the App Store for the iPhone, and you find a call recording app. So I've used several. Uh, I know a lot of people like, I think it's called ACR Cube, C-U-B-E. Uh, now there may be free versions, pay versions. So again, you just have to read reviews because these things are always changing. And again, test it out because I've had people use these apps and we only get one side of the conversation. And again, I say, did you test it? Like, well, no, I mean, it was so easy to use. And th that was my first call. Well, make the call to Equifax be your second call, <laughs> okay? Test it first because there's no point in doing this if you're not going to get a good recording, okay? All right, so that is what I had to share with you on the recording. So here's three questions to ask. I want to go through these, and then I want to also give you kind of a, a timeline perspective, okay? Because I think that can make it easier to understand. So number one, you, you, now they're going to identify who you are and all that sort of stuff, but here's the core of it. You say, what investigation did you do? You, you say you investigated it. You know, you sent me this results of investigation dated February 28th, 2023, and you said you investigated these five accounts and you made some changes. You didn't delete anything. Like, tell me what you did, okay? Now, usually they'll say, well, we contacted the lenders, I don't know why they call them that, but they'll call them the lenders. They're talking about the data furnishers like Capital One, Midland Credit, whoever it may be. And they'll say, and and they did an investigation and reported back to us. Like, okay, well, you, know, you may want to dig in a little bit. Like, well, how did you communicate with the lenders or the data furnishers? And let's start with Capital One. How did you communicate with Capital One? And they may say, well, we used eOscar. Well, if you were here for our last webinar or, you know, I have these on YouTube channel also, you know, we talk about eOscar. That's kind of the, the transmission network between the bureaus and the furnishers, okay? You say, okay, well, what did you do with eOscar? Well, we sent them this thing called an ACDV. Okay, what's an ACDV? Well, it stands for Automated Consumer Dispute Verification. All right, well, what was in the ACDV? They might tell you, well, did you attach my letter? You know, and you can do some follow-up questions like, did you pick up the phone and call Capital One? Did you call Midland? You know, maybe you're referencing a court case that you were successful in where Midland sued you and then you won that case. Did you call the court? No. Did you call the collection lawyer? No. So you can ask questions, okay? Make sure they're legitimate. In other words, we don't ask things like, how do you sleep at night or, you know, don't you think the president of TransUnion's overpaid or none of that garbage, okay? Like make it very focused, very relevant to what you're doing. You're trying to find out what investigation did they do. And what I like to do is when they sort of finish talking, you say, was there anything else that you did? No. Well, now we have on recording, if you're recording it, their explanation for exactly what they did in the investigation. Now, shockingly, sometimes when their witness raises their hand to tell the truth, they have a different story of what happened. Well, now that's interesting, right? The person, remember the, the results of investigation will say, if you have any questions, call us at 1-800-blah-blah-blah. And you did that. You took them up on the offer. And you asked the person that they told you to call. What happened in the investigation? They told you. And then their professional witness says, well, actually there was more, or that person was confused, or... Well, why do you have a confused person answering the phone? Seems to me to be a fair question in the lawsuit. But the point is, get the, the non-professional witness, get the person that's going to tell you the truth, get them on record as to what the investigation was. Then the second thing is you say, well, since you didn't fix Capital One and Midland and Citibank and First Premier Bank, whoever it is, I want you to investigate those again. Can I dispute those over the phone? Well, the answer is yes, you can. If they say no, say, why not? Why can't I dispute these over the phone? Okay. Ask for a manager. Why can't I dispute these over the phone? I've never had a credit bureau say, 
yeah, we're not going to let you. Well, actually, I take that back. One has, and but it's a horrible credit bureau. Not that any of them are great, but this one in particular is bad. But most of the time, they're like, oh, yeah, we can take a dispute over the phone. So they're going to say, which account? And that's where you don't want to be like, well, you know, I think it was Capital One and is it LVNV or Portfolio or Midland? So you don't want to do that. You want to have your letter, okay, have the results of investigation, have the new credit report, and say, okay, I know there are four accounts. So, I, so it's a Capital One. Uh, the open date is such and such. The account number is this. You know, the balance is this. Then there's a Midland portfolio. You just identify the accounts. Make sure they're getting the correct one. And then they'll say, well, what would you like me to put for the reason? Well, this is the way I recommend to my folks to do it which is say the reasons I put in my letter. Now, if they address some of those, then obviously you don't want to ask them to do the same thing they've already fixed. But you, know, you can say, see a lot of times they don't fix anything. You say exactly what I put in my letter. And the person may say, well, I, I can't look at your letter and type in the, the reasons for the dispute. So that's no problem. I'll just read you my letter. Now, you don't have to start from the top. Just here's the capital one. You know, it's two or three or four or five, six paragraphs. Just read it to them. And sometimes they'll say, well, you know, this is going to take a long time if you've got multiple accounts. Are you sure you want to, you know, read that to me? Don't you want me to just check a box like not mine or you know, no? I want to take the time. I got plenty of time. You got time, don't you? I got time. Let's Let's make this thorough. Let's get all the reasons we need to get in order to do the dispute. And so you can read it. I would also suggest that you have read through your dispute letter again, read through the results of investigation, read through the new credit reports, so you know exactly what the problem is. You're like, well, hey, you don't list the date of first delinquency and you don't have payment history. How am I supposed to figure out when you say I went you know, first delinquent? Or you, know, you have on here date of last payment, and you have a date and the amount paid is zero. That doesn't make any sense. How can a zero be a last payment? Okay. Or you have that I was current and then the next month you have, I was 90 days late. How is that possible? Okay. So just take your time, be patient, be prepared and just go through there. And even if the person's like, well, you know, this, this call is taking longer than it should. So it's okay. You know, I, let, let's finish this. Or if you need somebody else, you know, don't hang up on me. But if you want me to talk to somebody else, I will. I'm not going to repeat what I've already said, but I'll keep going. And you're like, okay, okay, fine. You know, we'll, we'll get through this. And so that's the second part. So number one is, what did you guys do in the investigation? Specifically, tell me what you did. Number two, I want to dispute XYZ accounts again. And then number three, I want you to send me my full, complete file disclosure. File disclosure just means everything that they have on you, they're supposed to send to you with very few exceptions. So here's another way to think about this, okay? Think about it in terms of a timeline. So if if I have sort of my camera, because I think it's making me backwards here, this is the beginning, okay? And this is the end. So think about, and like where my head is, is like, you know, present day, okay? So looking back, in the past, they did an investigation, right? Because they sent you a letter that said, we have completed our investigation. That means it was done in the past. So you say, you know, what did you guys do back then? Now, back then might have been, a, you know, two weeks ago or a month ago or however long. And so they do that. So now we're coming forward to right now. And you say, okay, well, since you didn't delete it back then, right now, I want you to dispute this. I want you to investigate these. Okay, so they do all that. And then you say, and now I want you, this would be in the future, it might be two minutes from now or two days from now or two weeks from now. I want you to send my full file disclosure. Now, I'm not saying you have to literally use those words. It's This is more just to sort of keep it straight in your mind. Like, hey, what'd y'all do in the past? Let's investigate these again. And then in the future, I want you to send me my full file disclosure. Normally they'll say, well, we'll do that when we send you the results of investigation. And by the way, they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, your credit report's your full file disclosure. You don't have to argue with them about that. Just say, well, look, I, I'm not sure. All I know is I want it clear that I'm asking for my full, complete file disclosure. Everything you have on me, I want you to send to me. And they'll say, yes, we'll send you your credit report. You go, 
that's fine. Send me my credit report. Also send me my full file disclosure. And eventually they'll say, well, yeah, that's one and the same. Okay. As long as it, you're sending me my full file disclosure. Thank you very much. Okay. So again, we have sort of the past. What did you guys do in your investigation? The current, I want you to investigate these again. And then the future, send me my full file disclosure. Okay. So how does the call typically go? Well, first they have to identify you. Every bureau has different ways. You know, some can be very easy where they say, okay, look on your results investigation in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see this, you know, six digit code. You give them that, they may verify like the last four of your social. Others want, you know, your full name, middle initial, full social, date of birth, address, all of that before they'll even talk to you. You just have to sort of go with it and, and these policies can change, okay? So let's just think broadly. They have to identify you. They want to make sure that's not your neighbor calling. Okay. And then sometimes they'll say, well, hey, as an extra layer of security, particularly if you want to dispute something, they'll say, do you have a cell phone I can send you a passcode to? And you say, yeah. You give them your cell phone and they send you a little five digit text, you know, and you just, you, instead of typing that in like you would with the website, you just say it to them. Okay. Yeah. I got the code. It was five, three, two, one, four, whatever. They go, okay, thank you very much. And then there's a chance you may be transferred to somebody else. Like if you start doing, you know, there's more than one account and you're not just saying, oh, not mine, but you're actually giving them the details, which is how we train people to do this. Then they may transfer you to somebody else. That's fine. You may get somebody in a foreign country that's very hard to understand. If you can't understand them or it's a bad connection, there's nothing wrong with in a very polite way saying, I'm so sorry I'm having trouble hearing you or understanding you. Could you transfer me to another representative? Now, let me just say this. The people in foreign countries that are doing this, they tend to have accents, okay? It's not their fault, right? They're, they're doing a job. They're trying to feed their family. We don't need to get mad at them. Now, if we want to get mad, we get mad at Experian for putting somebody that can barely speak English that I'm supposed to communicate with. Remember their letter, their results investigation said, please call us at this number. And then I call it that number and I get somebody that can barely speak English. It's not the person's fault. It's the company's fault. Okay. So we don't get mad at, you know, Bob or Alex or whoever it is. We get mad at Experian or TransUnion or Enovis or Clarity or whoever it may be. Okay. And sometimes you'll get an American right away. Sometimes you'll get somebody from another country. I would just understand that, you know, be polite, be respectful, and we'll have this on another slide. You can be nice and persistent at the same time, okay? But let's not be rude or make any comments. Remember, this is being recorded, right? And and we're the good guys. They're the bad guys, okay? So we, we don't yell at them. We don't cuss at them, things like that. All right, so here are just some strategies, and I have written in here, you know, remember, this is being recorded. So be prepared, probably the most important thing, be prepared. You know, don't just say, well, I'm going to wing it. I think I remember, I think it was four accounts I was disputing, or maybe it was two or no, no, that was the other credit. Don't do that. Like get it all in front of you. Here's my letter. Here are the results investigation. Here's a new credit report. Spend the time to put all that together and, and be super prepared. You know, there's the old expression, the more you sweat and practice, the less you bleed in battle. Okay. Just the idea of being super, super prepared. Okay. Be nice, be persistent and be patient. Okay. So when the representative says, you know, like just imagine you have all these bogus inquiries and you're like, look, I, I want to challenge all of those. And they say, okay, well, I have to challenge or, or mark them one at a time. And it's going to take like 30 seconds per one. I go, okay. They go, well, how many are there? And you go, there are 37 of them. Oh my goodness, 37. You know how long this is going to take us? I say, that's okay. I, I got time. You, you okay with time or do I need to talk to somebody else? And see, they'll try to get you to sort of shortcut your dispute by claiming it's going to take too long. Well, the solution is call when you're prepared. Call when you're in a good place where you can record it if that's what you're doing or make really good notes and call when you have time and be patient. And say, hey, I got all the time in the world. This is super important to me to get my credit report accurate. I know it's important to you guys. Let's take whatever time we need, right? Kind of hard for them to argue with that. All right, so 
Uh, well, let me put the slide up. It, uh, I'm still unclear on the dates, okay? But you'll get a notification. It'll either be Monday and Tuesday or Thursday and Friday, probably two-hour sessions. The first session that I have marked in red is going to be how do we pull our real reports, okay? And we'll, we won't spend a whole lot of time on that because I probably have done 30 videos on why you should only use your real reports, not like credit monitoring and stuff. And then we'll talk about how do we analyze for errors, both in general and then specifically for each of the five bureaus we'll talk about. So that's Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, the big three, Innovus, which is like the fourth credit bureau, and then Clarity, which is owned by uh, Experian. And then the next day, and again, I realize not everybody can attend these live, but I just want to get these knocked out because my travel schedule is getting crazy again. And otherwise it'll be like June before we get to this. So I just want to knock them out in like two days and you'll get a recording, a, a link. If you don't get it, just reach out to me. But the second session we'll talk about, okay, we've got our real reports. We've analyzed those reports for errors. Well, now let's create the dispute letters. Okay. Let's get those letters prepared in the right way. And then let's understand how to send them out. Okay, certified mail. Okay, now I got my results back. How do I read that? How do I look at new credit reports? You know, why do I even need to pull them? And let's like synthesize, put all this together. And then of course, what we talked about today, and we'll just do this in an abbreviated fashion in the second session, is talk about calling the credit bureau. Okay, and then, okay, I think I got a lawsuit here. How do I find the right lawyer? Okay. Do I find somebody that's on a billboard? Do I find somebody that says they're the greatest Fair Credit Reporting Act lawyer in the world? Who do I look for? What do I need to share with them? What do I need from them to know whether they're the right fit for me? Okay. And so I'll give you some questions, some thoughts on how to find the right lawyer for that. So I've got uh, about oh. 30, 25 more minutes or so. And so I will go through these questions here. And uh, just as long as we have questions up until about two o'clock central time, I will be here. So let's see, Colt says, if we're in a single party consent state for recording phone calls, can we record a calls on the CRAs without notifying them? So, you know, it, every state's different, right? My view is that as long as they, the other side, the credit bureau says all calls may be recorded. Sounds like they're giving consent to it being recorded. So I, I know if I'm doing that, I don't, re I don't tell them I'm recording the call because they just told me they're recording the call and that it's allowable, right? It, all calls may be recorded. So I'm taking them up on that offer. Let's see. Uh, Liz says, I've asked for the full credit report disclosure. They told me there's no such report or file outside of what I see on my credit report. They had no idea what I was talking about. Yeah. So let me just show you that real quick. We'll see if we can um, pull this up because I want you to see what we're talking about when we say our full file disclosure. So we should be able to see it over here. All right. So this is section 1681G. And the title of this, make sure that's coming up, is Disclosures to Consumers. And it's really this section right here is my trackpad decided to go crazy. So it's every consumer reporting agency shall. So that's not like, well, it's a good idea, or maybe you should do it, or two out of three times you should do it. No, it's shall. That's you must. It's a command. Shall upon request, subject to 1681HA1, this title clearly and accurately disclosed to the consumer. All, you see, it, it's not 50%, 75%, all information the consumers file at the time of the request, except that. And then there are some exceptions here. Now, this sometimes gets complicated. They make arguments like, well, you know, we know what Congress said, but that's not, we shouldn't really have to do that. I, I would say definitely don't fight this battle on your own, but make the request for your full file disclosure. And then if you don't get it, then when you meet with a lawyer about suing for a lousy investigation, you know, terrible practices that they have, you can also say, and, you know, ask for my full file disclosure, and this is what they sent me. Okay. 
All right, let's see here. Um, yeah, Merle asked a question. Uh, Merle, if you'll send that to me in an email, and because that is a little off topic, I'll try to answer it the, the best that I can here. All right, Liz says, furniture records and hangs up on me when I say I'm also recording. Yeah, so <laughs> here's the funny thing about it. And, and and we have a lot of experience with debt collectors. Yeah, you know, debt collector will say, please be advised, all calls may be recorded a monitor. Or they'll say, hey, this is Bob on a recorded line. Who do I have the pleasure of speaking with? And you say, well, this is John Watts, also on a recorded line. I so, said, no, you can't record me. I'm like, well, Bob, you said you were recording me. They go, yeah, yeah, we can record you, but you're violating our privacy by recording us. I'm like, how is that possible? And then they hang up. Remember what I said. They do this because if the recording is helpful to you, it will be accidentally deleted in a computer glitch. If it's helpful to them, there are no computer glitches. They, I mean, they got that, you know, like you're cussing at them, yelling at them. Oh yeah, that recording is good. Okay, they're going to keep that. But if they do that to you or they lie to you or they just say outrageous stuff, those get deleted. Now, it's funny. They get deleted and we say, well, don't worry. We've got the recording. And like 30 minutes later, we get the email going, John, you'll never believe it. We just were able to recover that deleted recording. Really? <laughs> so that's why, you know, again, you have to make your own decision, okay, and decide what the law is. And, you know, you can meet with the lawyer in your state. But I'll just tell you what we do in my firm is for our clients, this is typically the approach as long as the other side says it may be recorded and we record it. All right. So uh, Arizona is one party recording state. Only one person needs to know the call or conversation is being recorded. Yeah. So that's what a one party state is. But here's where it gets a little more complicated. Let's say you call into the state of Florida. Now, which law applies? Is it your law or is it Florida's law? Well, what if you sue a company who has a lot of influence with the local DA? And they say, hey, look, you know, we got sued and there's this devastating recording. And uh, will you prosecute this person for violating, you know, Florida's law or California's law or whoever's law? Now, people go, well, that's so unrealistic. Well, maybe you should watch the news because there's a lot of craziness going on in the world. Okay. So, I would just make sure that either you say to the other side, hey, I'm recording this, or that they say it's being recorded. Again, make your own judgment call about that. Yeah, Colt, uh, voice memos on Mac OS and iOS. Yeah, great. Uh, Bill says, recorder app on App Store works well, $4.99 per month. I use it when I need it. Okay. Um, I guess maybe a decade ago, uh, I got one of these apps and you had to like call this number and then call another, like call the number that you're really calling and it sort of merges it together. It just seemed odd to me. Some of the apps will have like, a, you know, they sort of whisper every three minutes, this call being recorded. Okay. Maybe you don't want that. So get something, test it out, read the reviews. And remember something that's great today may be lousy next week. Okay. So Something that was great two weeks ago or great right now when I'm saying this and you're watching this six months from now may not be so great. So read the reviews, check them out. Uh, most of these have some sort of trial version and just see if it works for you. Now, personally, I like the very simple thing of it's on a speakerphone and I'm recording it on my Mac or my iPad or whatever computer I have or somebody else's cell phone, their voice memo. It's just really hard for that to go wrong, as long as your microphone is working on the recording device. But if you're doing an app and some glitch happens, you know, you may lose it. So uh, you just have to decide which one you want to do. All right, uh, let's see. Merley says, if the accounts on your credit report were already in default, how can you demonstrate that errors on those accounts in the report result in harm to you in your lawsuit? Just so a great question on damages and do keep in mind that even though it's the same federal law it may be interpreted differently damages may be interpreted differently in different parts of the country but here's sort of a simple way to look at it uh, let, let me give you an example i have a capital one account that's charged off 
And the date of first delinquency, all that means is the date I first went delinquent and then going forward in time, it's never been brought current. The date of first delinquency is going to be the trigger date for when that will come off of my credit report. Let's say the date of first delinquency is January 2015. 2015. Well, you know, January 2015. Well, it's got to come off in 22. Okay. But it's still on my credit report. And I sue for that. And they go, well, John, was that your account? Yeah, that was my account. Do you admit you didn't pay it? Yeah, I admit I didn't pay it. You admit it became charged off? Yeah, charged off. Anything else wrong with it? No. So how could you possibly be hurt? Well, you're not supposed to have it on my credit report. You know, there's a time limit. We call it the obsolescence period of how long something can be on my credit report. And you kept it on there too long. And that's upsetting to me. Now, again, every sort of jurisdiction, they handle emotional distress damages differently. So you have to know in your sort of neck of the woods here how this stuff is handled. Uh, but that's the idea is that it should not be on my credit report. Even though it's my account, yes, I, I defaulted on it. The law says it has to come off my credit report. And we're not getting into all the details and the exceptions and exceptions to the exceptions for this obsolescence period. I'm just using it to illustrate a point that if it's not supposed to be on my credit report, well, naturally it'd be upsetting to me. If it's not supposed to be on my credit report, but it is, isn't that factored into my FICO score, my Vantage score? Aren't they using that data? for something that should not be on there. So imagine I have perfect credit other than this Capital One that's a charge off. Well, even though it's from eight years ago, you know, it's still gonna be damaging to me, okay? But if it's not on there at all, it's gonna be better for me, right? So that's a way that we argue this because we represent a lot of people that, you know, start off with very damaged credit. Well. Can they be hurt? Yeah, just like in a car wreck, because you know, in my other life, we do personal injury. So somebody says, hey, a drunk driver hit me, and I had to have you know surgery on my spine. And the defendant says, yeah, but you weren't an Olympic-level athlete with a perfect spine. Yeah, well, if you wanted to only hit people who are Olympic-level athletes with perfect spines, guess what? You should hit people who are Olympic athletes with perfect spines. You hit me. You know, I'm 63 years old or 37 years old. I had an accident before at work. And my spine was messed up. You made it worse, okay? So the fancy way of saying this in the law is that we had a pre-existing injury or condition that was exacerbated by the defendant's negligent conduct. It was made worse. It was made more intense. So if I'm starting off with, you know, kind of a lower credit score and these companies are violating the law and, you know, I might have moved up 30 or 40 points. Well, that may be a lot more significant to me if I have a 560 credit score versus I have a 780 credit score. What does 40 points matter if I'm in the 700s anyway, right? But sure, it makes a huge difference to go from like 560 to 600 or 620 to 660. So, we just have to sort of marshal that evidence, bring it together, and be able to explain to a judge, to a jury, exactly how keeping these negative accounts did in fact hurt me. All right, so Colt says, about pulling full disclosures on the phone call, RESPA law requires send documentation that is used in this investigation. Is there anything in the FCRA law that says the same? Um, so you can ask for the method of verification. Okay, that would be under section, should be under 1681I, I for investigation. And plus the results of investigation will say, you may request the method of verification. So you certainly could ask for that when you're on the phone, okay? Uh, you, you're right though, they're not gonna send you, like they're not gonna send you the ACDVs or, you know, oh, here's a transcript of our call to Capital One, not that they ever call anybody. But uh, you certainly can ask for that method of verification. All right, Ellie says, uh, requested four times for the purchase agreement and the Mandarich Law Firm and debt collector sends piecemeal the credit card statement. I think cease and desist is next step. Yeah, so that's going to be uh, dealing more with the FDCPA, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. 
And you certainly need to be aware, are you in a lawsuit or are you not in a lawsuit? So has Mandarin sued you for LVNV or whoever it is? Are they sending you collection notices? Uh, you can do a cease and desist. Uh, you know, that's certainly an option. Just understand that may prompt them to sue you. If you're in a lawsuit, cease and desist doesn't really do much. I mean, I guess it make them stop calling you, but, uh, you know, really, if you're doing this and it's a serious matter, you really ought to have an attorney defending you in this case. So, um, you know, we've got other videos that talk more about the sort of the FDCPA side. All right. Bill says a lot of inquiries on my report. How can I stop them? Have my credit frozen due to ID theft? So there are some types of inquiries that are allowable, but let me take a step back. Every type of inquiry, there must be what's called a permissible purpose. And uh, if there's enough interest, I'll do a whole webinar on what are the permissible purposes, a lot of confusion. Even that name, permissible purpose, sort of sounds like I have to give them permission. That's not what it means. Now, giving permission is certainly a great way for a what's called a user. That's somebody who gets your credit report and uses it for job or, uh, you know, living in an apartment, uh, a, a loan approval, stuff like that. Uh, giving them permission is a great way for them to have permissible purpose. But there are other reasons. You may ask to do business with them. They may be reviewing an account that they may be about to collect on or to purchase. And that can give them the right. So there's all sorts of reasons why they can have a permissible purpose. They may be making you what's called a firm offer of credit. That's where you get in the mail. You know, you, you get a, an envelope in the mail and, you know, it's like you're pre-approved for a whatever credit card. Well, if you read through there, it'll say this is based on your credit report and this constitutes a firm offer of credit. Now, sometimes they're lying about that. It doesn't. That would make the credit pool illegal. Uh, do keep in mind, there is no difference between a soft pool and a hard pool under the law. Different scoring models may treat them differently. Okay, so typically a hard inquiry will lower your score, but there are rules about that. Like if you go within, let's say, a 14-day time period, a dozen different uh, car dealerships and they all pull your credit report, that's not going to count as, you know, 14 different, you know, credit pools. I mean, that it'll be on your credit report, but it's not going to lower your score for each one. So there are rules about it, but the law itself doesn't care about hard or soft pull. It just talks about pulling the credit report. And there has to be a permissible purpose. So, Bill, what I would do is I would look through there and say, okay, are these allowable? And if you're interested, just you know, shoot me an email from one of the things here, or you can send it to john at wattsherring.com and just say, hey, I'm interested in a, a webinar class on permissible pulls. It, the law can get a little confusing. It's not worded in the most clear way, but you know, we've done lots of these cases where we sue big banks and mortgage companies for doing illegal credit pools. So I think we've got a pretty good handle on what that involves. All right, let's see. Colt says, wife and I have joint mortgage where servicers' actions violate several RESPA laws. And that got us late payments. We sent notice of errors, requests for information. So let me just stop there. So RESPA is a law dealing with mortgages. And we can send letters to the mortgage company. In the past, these were called qualified written request or QWR. We don't really call them that anymore. Instead, we call them what Colt is calling them, a request for information, kind of what it sounds like. Give me information. Notice of error. Hey, I'm putting you on notice, mortgage company. You have committed an error. I want you to investigate and fix. So let's go back to the comment. Sent notice of errors, request for information to the mortgage servicer. Then we sent disputes to credit agencies, just like you stated YouTube. Uh, Nation Star, Mr. Cooper doubled down, haven't done anything to resolve this one, just got denied a home loan, had a large deposit on. I think we could litigate under the FCRA. If we get a lawyer to litigate FCRA claim, do we get damages individually for myself and my wife uh, or awarded jointly? So I'll, I'll say this. It can vary, I suppose. You know, you could have a judge say it has to be jointly. I, I've always done those individually because each of you have your own claim. Each of you have your own credit report. Each of you have your own, you know, how was it reported? How did this affect you? In other words, imagine that 
that I'm married and, uh, you know, there's a joint account. It messes up both of us and my wife loses top ser- uh, top security clearance and I'm unemployed and I'm not looking for a job. You know what I mean? So we would have different damages. And so I, I would also just remind you when you meet with a lawyer, you know, talk about the RESPA claims too. Those can be valuable because under RESPA, when we send a notice of error about credit reporting, then a lot of times that credit reporting has to be sort of frozen for a period of time. And they often don't do that. So we've had a lot of lawsuits against nation star, Mr. Cooper. And so Colt, I don't know where you live. If you want to you reach out to me, you know, if you're in Alabama, I'm glad to sit down and talk to you. Uh, if you're in another state, you know, I may know somebody in that other state. So just feel free to reach out to me. All right, let's see. Uh, Ryan says, I filed an FCRA case on behalf of a client. It's a status case, 13 negative counts, lots of obvious errors. Litigation department emailed and asked me for my client's address, date of birth, last four social. Is this normal? They're just trying to find his file. Would you give them this information? Any uh, advice on that? Uh, ask for a settlement demand. Yeah, it sounds like probably Equifax. You would get either paralegal at their big law firm that represents them, or it might be an in-house paralegal. Um, we give that to them. Uh, usually what I do is I just send them a copy of our dispute letter and the results of investigation. Say, go find them. Because <laughs> it's amazing. They'll say, be like, yeah, we can't find this person. I'm like, really? You know, you can't find them. And, you know, we'll give them like, you know, here's a report number from the credit report. They're like, oh, we can't use that to find them. So I just, you know, try to accommodate them in that. Uh, we don't ever give a settlement demand without seeing the ACDVs. So remember, there's the sort of e-Oscar. Here's the credit bureau. Here's the furnisher. The credit bureau will send an ACDV through e-Oscar to the furnisher, who then sends it back to the credit bureau. And that ACDV is just sort of like a you know form document that has the account and and what you're complaining about. Usually, I have a a place that says like image attached or document attached, and that means they attach your letter, which is good. Uh, if a credit bureau does not send the ACDV to the furnisher, then you can't sue the furnisher, okay? Because they have no liability unless they get notice from the credit bureau. You can send 27 letters to the furnisher. It doesn't matter under the FCRA. Now, California can be a little different. I'm just talking about the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Uh, but if, if the credit bureau did send the ACDV, now they both have liability the bureau and the furnisher. So what if the credit bureau did not send the ACDV? So think about this way. You've got these two defendants, right? The credit bureau and the furnisher. Well, if the furnisher didn't get the ACDV, they fall off. Well, now all you have is credit bureau. Well, they should pay more, right? Because section 1681I says they shall, again, not, it's a good idea. You shall notify the furnisher. They didn't do it. It's a pretty blatant violation, okay? So that's what I would do. And if you want to talk, you know, offline, uh, just reach out to me and I'm uh, happy to do that. All right, Stacy, is it best to dispute with the credit bureau first, then the collection agency credit, or does it really matter? So um, I'll say this. We usually don't send anything directly to the furnisher because the credit bureau is going to send our letter to the furnisher. That's connected to that ACDV, that automated consumer dispute verification. Uh, There are times when we might get a credit report and we say, okay, there are some errors by Midland, but we choose to to reach out directly to Midland with a special type of letter. And uh, we don't go through the credit bureaus for that. But now we may dispute everything else on the credit report. We just don't do it with Midland. That's really just a strategy call. Uh, I know some people they send, you know, I'm doing round one to the bureau and then round one to the furnisher and round two. And we don't really do that. I mean, we, we've we added one step to our process. And we've had cases before where we've done like six rounds of dispute. Just We're just like giving them more and more rope, okay? But typically what we're doing is we send a letter and then they don't fix it. They don't delete it. We make a phone call. They don't fix it. They don't delete it. Then we sue them, Okay. So I'm not typically sending letters to the furnisher. And so I hope that answers your question. Uh, Let's see. 
Uh, Blaine said ACR cube is two ninety nine for one week or nineteen ninety nine for a year. Okay, that's good to know. And I've had some clients that have used that. They say it's good, super easy. You just, I think you pull up that app, and then it sort of connects with your, you know, like your phone app. And so you dial in and you just press a big red button and it starts recording. Okay. So uh, that one seems to be easy, but again, like I, you know, <laughs> I don't have an affiliate link there, uh, you know, and I don't know what they're doing tomorrow or what update they're going to have. So definitely check things out, but that's good on the price there. All right. D says creditor sent settlement for LVNV pay for delete. How are the original creditors web bank? Should I pay uh, thoughts? So yeah, you really have to decide. Um, well, first of all, I would say who's reporting LVNV or resurgent capital typically is reporting is web bank still on there. If they are, it should be a zero balance that they sold it to LVNV. And so you might get LVNV off, but that's not going to get web bank off. So then you look and see, are there errors with web bank? So you may want to pay LVNV. I'll say, I don't like paying the debt collectors any money. Okay. But you know, that's a choice to make to do like a pay for delete. Just make sure you're very clear. Who are you paying? When are you paying? How do you pay? Okay. Cashier's check, money order, wire transfer. Like, how are you paying? You know, I may have already said this, but when are you paying? You know, so I've seen people that the deadline is, you know, March the whatever, the 8th, and they pay March the 15th. And the, the debt collector says, Thank you for doing that. You know, you owed 5,000. We told you if you paid three, we'd go away. Well, you missed the deadline. So thank you for paying that three. Now you still owe us two. So make it very, very clear. Who are you paying? How are you paying? What are you paying? How much? When? All those types of questions. Get that absolutely clear. So either in writing, like an email, a letter, or on a recorded line. But again, you've got to have the recording, okay? If they have the recording and they find out they did something wrong, now again, they would just like howl in anguish at what I'm saying. And this is outrageous. I'm just telling you from doing this for, you know, over two decades now, coming up on 28 years, you know, it's amazing the coincidence, the good recordings are accidentally deleted. Just saying, you know, choose uh, which path you want to take there. All right. Uh, let's see. Ellie said this going back to the Mandarich firm. I'm in a lawsuit. Haven't gotten served. I would go ahead, Ellie, talk to a lawyer in your state that does that type of work. I know Mandarich, we don't have them in Alabama, at least to my knowledge. Uh, they're in Georgia. There's a great lawyer in Georgia, Steve Koval in Atlanta. Talk with him. Um, you know, if you're in some other state and you can't find a lawyer, reach out to me. I may know somebody that does what we call debt defense there. All right. Um, let's see. Wendy says the recording for this for later. Uh, yeah, it should be. If you don't get a, a link that says, you know, I think the title is like replay link or something. Um, and I think, you know, if it, this recording has been going an hour, I think it takes like an hour to process or more. You, so you should get a link sometime today. If you don't, just let me know and I can go sort of manually find the link and get that to you. And let's see, Murley asked about travel schedule. Um, yeah, so I don't think I'm going to be anywhere near you, Murley, but if I am, I'll let you know. And uh, yeah, I'd enjoy getting to meet you. Let's see, Jessica, what violations under 15 uh, USC section 1692 trigger a lawsuit against a debt buyer? Well, that's kind of a, a whole webinar itself. You're looking for the made false statements, have they been harassing, oppressive to you? You know, there's a whole list of things. Um, you know, I would just say, it, really, with anybody, when you're looking at these federal statutes, uh, it absolutely makes sense to get with a lawyer in your state, okay, as soon as you can, because people will come to me and they've been fighting for six or nine months. And I'm like, you know, I try to say it in a nice way, but I'm like, you know, none of that is any good. Like, we're going to do it this way. This is the right way to do it. And so it's just easier when people come to me. So like when clients uh, say, hey, I just got this collection letter. Well, great. We'll tell you the right type of letter to send, you know, get that sent out. And it's much better than, you know, waiting. So I would just get with somebody as soon as I could. All right. 
Bruno says, go to a dealership, give them permissible purpose. That gives them the right semi information to six banks. Uh, if I want to challenge those, do I challenge a dealership or the banks? Should be a limit to how many banks they shop. Well, that, that that's an interesting question because the customer is they can send it out to a bunch of banks. Uh, really, if you don't want them to do that, you got to like limit it when you give them permission. Okay. So let, let me give you an example. and We'll wrap this up pretty soon because I got to jump off. If I go to a dealership and say, I want to test drive a car and they want some information, I go, look, I do not want you to pull my credit report. You do not have permission to pull my credit report. All I'm doing is test driving a car. I have no idea if I want to do business with you. And they say, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We get it. We're not going to pull your credit. They pull my credit. Yeah, I'm suing the dealership, okay? Uh, and a lot of times we'll dispute that through the bureaus, okay? Whether it gets deleted or not, we're still suing the dealership because they lied to us. But uh, on your specific question, I would just go in and say, look, I only want you to apply at, I did this one time when I was getting a car loan. I said, I only want you to apply at the certain credit union. Nowhere, you have no permission to apply anywhere else, only this credit union. And... They did that. Well, what if they applied at six other places? Well, they would violate the law, in my view, because they wouldn't have permission to do that. So I would just sort of go back and say, okay, did I? Did we have this conversation? If we didn't, then I think it's a hard task that you've set before yourself. I don't think you're going to be able to, to make much headway if you didn't specifically say. Now, if they're sending out inquiries, you know, three months after you, uh, you know, applied, I think that's a problem. In other words, they don't have permission, in my view, for the rest of your life to send it to six banks every single day. Uh, so I would start with the dealership. And sometimes if you call the dealership and explain what's going on, they'll say, okay, yeah, I'm sorry about that. And they'll delete some of those. All right. Uh, let's see, Ellie, next to Mandarich Law, it says California debt collector license applications currently pending. Yeah. So I would just say if you're in California, you know, get with the California consumer lawyer to see if that matters. It may, it may not. And, uh, but they would know about that. All right. Let's see. Cole, thank you for teaching me about RESPA and FCRA through YouTube videos, live streams, men's help. We should represent people in Utah. Well, Utah would be a very beautiful state. <laughs> so uh, I, I hope you will have a lot of success there, Colt. And thank you for the kind words, but you've done the hard work on this. Uh, if you need a lawyer in Utah, just let me know. I may know somebody there that I could refer you to. Uh, let's see. Um, Merle says, Ryan, what state are you? In? I think if I remember right, Ryan is in New York. Um, if I may be wrong on that, but I think maybe Northeast somewhere. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, Blaine said the first week of that AC or yeah, ACR cube is free. So that's great. Um, Shan says our accounts are past statute limitations to collect handled the same way as those who aren't N not exactly. Um, for example, if a debt collector says we may sue you, well, that's fine if the statute of limitations not expired, but if it has expired, most places say that would violate the FTCPA fair debt collection practices act. And then you start getting into some strategy, you know, do I dispute this account if it's past the statute, if it's not past the statute? So uh, it gets a little complicated, but th there are some factors there. See, George said, any plans on attending CreditCon 2023? Yeah, I uh, am not doing that. I'm going, ironically, I think I'll be in New Orleans the week before, the week after. We have a consumer uh, lawyer meeting. There'll be, I don't know, five or 600 consumer lawyers there. It just so happens to be right after Credit Con. Uh, I've been to Credit Con before. It's an interesting place, and uh, I like those guys. And uh, you know Matt Listro, who runs that, great guy. So I won't be there, but if you're going to be there, I hope you learn lots of good stuff. And uh, let's see, Bill, thank you for these videos where you're very welcome. And uh, Merle, do a video on interlocutory appeal writ of mandamus. So uh, let, let me give you the 20-second version on that, then we'll wrap this up. So typically you can only file an appeal, and this might vary by state. I'm just telling you, in federal court and in Alabama court, you can only appeal what are called final orders. And that's when generally every claim against every party has been resolved. The reason is the appellate courts don't want, as soon as a judge makes one decision, you know, he says, 
Um, the plaintiff will be deposed first and then the defendant will be deposed. It's like, boom, we're appealing. And then he says, okay, you get 30 interrogatories, not 35. Boom, we're appealing. The appellate court's like, we don't want to deal with all that. So wait till the whole case is over. Uh, you can do sometimes what's called an interlocutory appeal. That means it's not final. Usually though, there's got to be some special reason. Like there's a lot of uncertainty about the law. Sometimes the trial judge can certify it say, hey, appellate court, I think you ought to take this. Other times they, they won't do that. A writ of mandamus is sort of a fancy way of saying we want a higher court to order the judge to do something. So this will typically come up in something where it would be very harmful to wait to the end of the case. So a defendants oftentimes when, when we sue defendants, we say we want a list of all the other people you've done this to and say a judge orders that they go, Oh, this is terrible. We want the court to issue a writ of mandamus to the trial judge. And so again, those are considered extraordinary, very hard to get those because again, the general rule is the appellate courts do not want to be bothered with every little detail of a trial or they might as well be the trial court. So those are very, very hard. Uh, I think Merley, maybe you're in Illinois, uh, yeah, that's going to be very, very specific to your state. So um, typically that's in the rules, the rules of civil procedure, but also just you read the case law. Yeah, you know, if you just get on like Google Scholar and type in your state and, you know, like the criteria for writ of mandamus or interlocutory appeal, that should give you some information. And let's see, Jerry, uh, thank you for your information. We won three trial cases against LVM. Man, that's fantastic. And Jerry, I don't know if you're the one that reached out to me today, um, but if so, uh, I'd love to hear from you about how you did that. And if you didn't reach out, okay, yeah. So um, just send me you know, a, a good phone number to reach you and maybe some time next week, or I may even have some time tomorrow, but just give me your schedule over the next week or so. And uh, I'd love to find out about how you won those cases. Were there any appeals and things like that? So, well, guys, I've got to run. Uh, thank you so much for being here. It always amazes me when people show up to these. So uh, I'm glad you're interested and hopefully you're getting good value from these. Again, next week, it'll either be Monday and Tuesday or Thursday, Friday. You'll get a notification. At least you should from my uh, the webinar company I use, Demio. Uh, you should get something telling you when those will be. And if for some reason you miss them and you don't get a replay link, just email me and, and we'll put those out there. So you guys have a fantastic rest of your day. Fantastic. Uh, maybe early start to your weekend and I will catch you guys next week. Okay. Bye-bye.